I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Mary Custis is an actress, comedian and writer. Best known for her creation of one of Australia's most loved characters, Effie, Mary's diverse film, TV and stage roles have garnered critical acclaim and numerous awards. Her powerful and moving memoir, All I Know, detailed her heartbreaking battle to become a mother and has been the subject of not one, but two 60-minute stories. What has been your favourite Five of My Life story so far? Well, I am a huge Charlie Teo fan. Ah, uh, just okay. just because uh, my definition of a star is someone that that uh, changes the world, and he's changed the world of um, brain surgery and the lives of so many, of which I know a few people that have that were the two in the two hard basket, and if it wasn't for Charlie, they wouldn't be here. So uh, plus, I just love his whole vibe and. Um, you know, and I feel for the negative attention that he gets, uh, and I get it. Anyone that does something different is going to garner a bit of that, and he's had a lot of it. Um, but he's a fascinating guy with, um, you know, uh, such a talent um, and no better talent as far as I'm concerned. Well, I am really glad you like that episode. That's, what, that's one of my favourites. And, yeah, what a, what a bloke. He, he's and it's of... nice to hear people speak positively of themselves. Yes. You know, especially when, you know, the majority of uh, people are forever having to apologise, and that's a very cute Australian thing, but uh, the Greeks aren't really like that, and I'm one of those as well. It's interesting. It, you would want your brain surgeon to be able to say, I'm a good brain surgeon, wouldn't you? Of course. You go, I'm not really good at this. I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm average. You go, yeah, I'm going to give it a go. Go. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> now, uh, I am so grateful to you for, A, coming on, but just for choosing the film that you chose. Because you chose a film that has in it, and I will brook no disagreement, one of the greatest moments in cinematic history. You chose Cinema Paradiso from 1988, and the ending crying scene makes me sob like a baby, and I did it all over again when I watched it in your honour. But tell me uh, why you chose that film and your story behind it. Oh, my God. Um, Look, I don't openly weep with volume. I like to think I'm a quiet crier and an unattractive one at that. Oh, uh, ugly crying. Oh, yeah. Excellent. My husband's a beautiful crier. He cries like Julia Roberts. You know, big fat (laughs) tears coming out of both, you know, uh, tear ducts at the same time rolling down, Uh, whereas I'm the fist. My face turns into a fist because I try to fight the cry. Uh, well, I lost the battle with this film. Um, uh, on a million levels, this film touches me. Um, the aesthetic, the time in history, this little boy who I, I love, you know, in all those Sophia Loren films, there was always a skinny little Italian boy running around that was just, um, you know, full of life and naughtiness. And, um, and, and the opening scene of how we meet the character where he's a little altar boy and falling asleep at the job, Um, and then his love of the movies Um, and this relationship that he forms with the projectionist, Alfredo, that is fraught, honest and um, epic in proportion. By the end of the film, 
you know, um, that is when I howl out loud is, um, you know, what, what was possible um, in terms of stumbling across a father figure for this little boy that put him on his path. Uh, and that path would alienate him from his childhood and take him away from that Sicilian village, but that would put him on a, you know, a national and global stage. I love those sorts of stories. On that theme of having to, to leave your sort of homeland to find your dream, it, how does that play in your life? Well, you know, um, not at all similarly, but, I, 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 you know, the Greek in me is always going to relate to Sicily. You know, we were there. Um, but I grew up in Collingwood in a very working class um, suburb and somehow, and I don't know how, but through good loving and a strengthened community and, you know, a very democratic one at that, you know, we're all poor and a very multicultural one, I found myself thrust into the middle class, the white middle class, where uh, I was in um, a minuscule minority. And somehow that 10 years of solid Collingwood loving, understanding community spirit was then somehow I managed to leapfrog the next decade and then make it my life's mission to uh, create heroes out of that experience and those characters that were minimised um, by the white middle class, but uh, absolutely adored and uh, they were so lively and uh, exciting for me. And, um, and I, you know, created a character that is full of all that goodness. So uh, you, um, I mean, we're going to come on and talk about this, I am sure, but to create an enduring character that is loved as much now, 30 years later, is an incredible achievement. And I've seen you on a number of occasions. And the amount of yeah, love and goodwill and engagement you get from your audience, is, is a, it's a joy to see. It's a bit like, I mean, the, the, the analogy is completely imperfect, but Dame Edna or whatever, you've created something that, that just exists and will always exist, and that's a, that's a massive achievement. Well, it, it's um, a shock to me that uh, a character from a sitcom essentially was able to have decades of, um, you know, uh, attention and, and power and, and, you know, audiences and all the freedoms that she has bought me um, because not many characters from sitcoms go on to do that. Yeah, it wasn't the plan when you first did no, it. No, but I was lucky enough to see a path and I took it, which is sort of, you know, um, the gift in life. If you're able to somehow navigate your way around what gets in your way and, and create the life you want for yourself, and I was able to do that through Effie. One final question about the actual film, a mm. detail, is through watching it again and researching it, I, I didn't realise that there was a director's cut that mm. the director was very, very passionate about. He yeah. didn't want the film that won the Oscar to be the one that... I've seen, 123 minutes long. He wanted the 173-minute version that he did that involves the character getting back with Elena. It changes the entire film. Yeah. right? Um, so his art work was sort of cut against his will by other people. Is, is that something that, that, that you experience or have ever experienced where you go, hold on, I, I, I don't know, I wanted Effie to have a motorbike and I'm not allowed to or, or, or I want to do that film role and you're not going to let me or... Yeah, no, because um, I, haven't, I haven't encountered that firsthand because I write most of what I do. Right. In Acropolis now I shared the writing responsibilities with a handful of other writers and we, we all wrote particular episodes and we would sit at the beginning of the year and work out what the storylines are and who would take what episode and we worked very closely with the script editor and off we went. And in terms of the books... The corporate stuff, like you, Nigel, I'm in the corporate sector a lot, which I love because it's so anti-performance and it's such a challenge. Um, and then with all the stage things that I do, I write myself. So I feel like I have um, the ability to just say what I need to say, do what I need to do, uh, uncompromised. Television is a different beast. You know, once you start doing a television show and I love it, but I don't want to be in that sphere for too long because it's too compromised. There are too many hands on it. Um, take Acropolis out of the mix because when we did Acropolis, no one knew much about what we were doing. It was working. It came off the back of a very successful stage show, Wogs Out of Work, and they let us, let us do our thing. But since then, um, there are a lot of people in television that aren't particularly 
creative that are in more um, executive roles or, you know, that, that like to have input. And television is ve- very reactionary. You know, like they'll say, oh, let's get the person that was on the front cover of Her magazine last week in terms of casting or whatever. They, they react. L- let's for- do another Friends. Exactly. Their reference points are things that have already been done way too many times. Yep. So it's not where you go to pioneer necessarily, although that's changed because now there's so many different platforms. Having just finished Ozark last night, oh, you know, forget don't it. Don't spoil it, don't spoil it. I'm um, not saying a thing. But now there are all these avenues which didn't exist when I was in television a lot. And so I would be tempted to go back. I think bravery is now something that's a little bit more supported. And... um but, yeah, I'm able to do exactly what I want to do when I want to do it, and that's the privilege of success. Well, bravery is a great link to your second choice. Now, if I was more qualified, I would say that there is uh, something profound in the fact that both your film and your book are written from a protagonist through a child's eyes. Uh, and you've chosen the book that is regularly voted as America's favourite book. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It sold over 40 million copies. It is the sensational 1960 Harper Lee to kill a mockingbird. Uh, Tell me about that, Mary. Well, you know, you look at what has influenced you for a lifetime and what sears itself, you know, in your consciousness. And that book, I think it was um, part of the curriculum. And... You know, it really opened my eyes to a world and uh, this uh, very cruel way of cutting up society in different ways of, you know, either through colour, through class, through gender, and how one person can change things and, and it just makes you so conscious of what has happened for way too long. And seen through the eyes of this little tomboy girl, and I was that, you know, who was very intrigued with her community, had a great relationship with her brother. I had an older brother as well. Had a very um, philosophically sound, good father, which I had as well, luckily, and that was witness to much that didn't sit right with her. And, um, And I think often when we tell stories through a child's point of view, you cannot argue with that because a child is a marker of truth. And, and regurgitates, um, you know, I always say to my husband about our daughter, you know, we're being recorded, we're being recorded. And they do, they record um, what's right and they record what's wrong and they play it back to us. And so um, I've, I've been, you know, forever changed by that book as well as George Orwell's 1984 and, and, and a heap of others. But that one was the first one which put race on the map for me because I was having a similar experience right? in in the shadows of what this captures on a much bigger level. So, yeah, that book did that for me. There's something, um, and again, I'm really grateful that you got me to, you know, re-watch Cinema Paradiso and re-read To Kill a Mockingbird. It is researching the book, which I didn't know, is Harper Lee's father was an attorney. Yes. Who in? I mean, I, I actually wish I hadn't found this out. Mm. So thank you for Cinema Paradiso, and damn you! For this, <laughs> is uh, her dad was a criminal attorney who tried a case of a father and son, shopkeeper and his son, uh, a black couple who supposedly had murdered a white person, uh, and he failed, and they were hung and mutilated, and he never tried another case. Oh. God. And so I, I find some pathetic protection in awful fiction being fiction. Yeah. yeah. I know it's ridiculous, because, but you thought, of the, well, at least it's not true. Yeah. Go, no, 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 it is true. I mean, you know, so the Atticus Finch character, wow, amazing. And, and I'd, I'd love you to talk uh, about your dad, because he's clearly a wonderful man you had a great relationship with. You just talk about his yeah. influence on your life. Um, and, and maybe a little bit of the cinema parody, so um, Salvatore or Toto character having lost a father young, and I, I lost mine at 23 and that felt way too young. Uh, I didn't know anyone that I was close to that had lost a parent at that age. Mm. So it was like, oh, okay, so I'm going to have to charter this on my own. And, I mean, apart from my brother, I had no one else that could really understand. But separate to that, who he was in my life and how he didn't fit in any box and how bigger picture he was, how entrepreneurial he was, and 
and how he was able to plant seeds that he knew would grow well after his death. So my dad had a heart attack the year before I was born. So the clock was ticking. And um, I'd never heard him say a bad word about anyone, anyone. And he, this might capture him in an essence. Um, I had a cousin who was engaged to this guy who um, was very difficult to manage. He was a very angry young man. And um, one day I went for a walk with my cousin and this guy and came back home and I was not in a good way. And my dad said, what's up? And I said, well, Peter, you know, was saying this and he was saying that and he was really judgmental of my relationship with you and um, said that I had everything I needed in life and, you know, um, because he'd had a terrible relationship with his own father, there was violence and whatever. And and my dad, you know, when we talk about pitching movies and how you use the least amount of words possible, my dad captured the essence of conflict and was able to solve this riddle for me with saying, Peter is Peter. And why would you expect him to be anything else? Like the disappointment lies in the fact that you're expecting him not to be who he is. And his life experience has shaped him to be who he is. And you should be objective enough to be able to see that instead of be triggered by it. Uh, He also told me that um, I should, well, he bought me a a typewriter when I was seven and he said that I should write. Wow. Have you still got it? No, but weirdly, my six and a half year old daughter and I went and bought her a typewriter. Okay. Um, just the other day, just because you don't know what yeah. seeds are getting planted. Circle of and, life. Yeah. So, um, he said to me uh, when I told him that I wanted to be an actress, which was a huge disappointment to him. He wanted me to be a lawyer because he <laughs> thought I had the capacity <laughs> to do that, and also because I was all about justice. Um, I said to him, "Well, I can't think of a more difficult job, and I think I've." you know, I perhaps have some talent in this department. He said to me, all right, but I want you to do one thing. Don't expect anyone to stop living their life to make your dreams come true. That's your job. So he sort of empowered me with this, you know, create your own destiny, create your own opportunities, this entrepreneurial migrant, you know, um, spirit of make your own small business. And that's what happened. Wow. And he died before I had any success. In fact, he died literally the week before I got my first big break. Right. Gosh, so, 23. That is, you yeah. were 23. Yeah. It was not a tragedy. Um, you know, you've got to be careful when you're looking at things and give things the right words. It was not a tragedy. It was just a humongous loss. And I'm able to know what a tragedy is because since then I've been able to experience that as well which we undoubtedly are going to come on to. We're going to, going to come on to your third choice, and I am really grateful that you are the first person that is adding a Stevie Wonder track to the Five of My Life Spotify playlist. Uh, it's from an album that I have discovered. Elton John, Michael Jackson, George Michael and Prince, all independently and separately uh, nominated as the best album ever recorded and their favourite. You think, wow. An album I had not listened to. I know lots of the songs are it, but I had not listened to that album in full. Uh, It's Songs in the Key of Life, uh, and you have chosen the first track, the remarkable, gorgeous, wonderful Loves in Need of Love Today. Yeah. Uh, Mary, tell us about that. Well, it was the first album I bought. My brother Ah, and I bought it, and I knew every lyric. And having been so um, affected by To Kill a Mockingbird, for me to discover someone who was blind that could see so much, that could comment on those same issues of race um, and that could do it in a capsule that's so optimistic, you know, like really service the difficult medicine in, you know, a sugar-covered capsule. You know, his, his music was so optimistic. Um, and yeah, when, when I read those lyrics, I was astounded at how much power, you know, art can have, you know, um, the book did that for me and this album did that for me. And I thought that it was like a mandate that anyone that would go in the arts would need to express 
however it came about, however, it, you know, its genre or, you know, what, what the um, bells and whistles were, something of some importance to comment or to shift or to expose something that was important. You know, I'm worthy by nature. You know, I thank God for comedy. I'd be unbearable without it. Um, but I see life as pretty bloody important, you know, and, uh, and I take it very seriously. And if it wasn't for my sense of humour, I don't know, I would be very alone, put it that way, uh, <laughs> unknown, broke and <laughs> hating myself. So I thank God for artists like that. So th- th- there's something in that song that I, I mean, I mean he's, he's just a, a genius to write, you know, Sir Duke and all those wonderful, mm. uh, just incredible, on one level, they're amazing to listen, dance to, blah, blah. But the, the notion, love's in need of love, it, you go, it, it's such a profound thought where for me in my life, I, I, I like to think that I, I don't cause anybody any harm and I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully got good morals, et cetera, et cetera. But what that... Song is saying is, you know, no, you've got to go one level further. You have a responsibility to do something, to be proactive, rather than just not be a lawbreaker and cause problems in your family and be a nightmare, which I think is, is an achievement to actually reach that level because most people aren't. But, but no, to go further. Love is in it. You need to do something. And yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to, to hear you talk to that in terms of your art because I, th- I, think, I, I think you do more than just give people a fabulous belly laugh for two hours. I, th- I think you put a little drop of goodness in the world. Well, we know that, you know, like we've had to analyse what happiness is, um, which is weird considering how good so many of us have it. And by that I mean living in a free country um, that, you know, uh, that's a mixture of all different types of races and, and for, for much of the Western world that is lucky enough to be free and to, to have the right to an opinion, you know, we've got it good. You know, our starting place is pretty strong. But we know that one of the key pillars of happiness is service, being of service, you know, uh, devoting yourself back to your community and having some purpose. Those two things, apparently also a very good bowel movement and eight hours of restful sleep. <laughs> those in are what other, order? <laughs> uh, actually, those other two things, those last two things seem to be one and two, <laughs> which we understand at that time when we're having that experience, when right. we wake up rested, we're like, wow, I can do anything. <laughs> when we walk out going, wow, I don't even know how did that happen? Um, but uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, all my themes come back to several things that I cannot let go of, which is um, how I was strengthened by... Uh, a very dynamic, honest, um, inclusive community in the first 10 years of my life and how I've devoted myself to giving back to that community and and how comedy is, you know, intravenous when it comes to, you know, um, making points or bringing joy or uniting people. And so I was able to everything that I've touched in my life that has touched me, shaped me, whether it's university, going and studying performing arts, um, that being my major, studying anthropology, psychology, journalism, all of those things I've been able to plat together to create the life and the work that I've wanted to do. Um, Effie's been the biggest gift, but also could I have gone off and done a million other things? Perhaps, you know, and, and I've done many other things outside of that character, but it's that character that allows me to infiltrate all these different stiff, uh, politically correct, uh, corporate um, community places that require, you know, some form of perforating, you know, um, some um, to put that character in that reality to say, I deserve to be here as much as anyone else, not more so as much as anyone else, whether it's me doing the, you know, the midwinter ball in Canberra, which is the biggest corporate gig of the year, a couple of times, uh, whether it's any other sort of elite um, reality, to go in there with this character and to make a mark and to be, you know, the people's buffet, the voice of the of the Bogans, the Wogs, the suburban people, the, you know, is, is really um, something I can't imagine I could have got a rush out of more doing something else.
Your fourth choice. We are going to uh, the Ionian Sea. Have I pronounced yes. that correctly? Uh, we're going to a beautiful island from all the images that I've seen, uh, Ithaca. Uh, please tell me about that. Okay, well, uh, you know, my personal journey um, didn't exist until I wrote a memoir and then sort of put an X-ray of my biggest pain now, points. No, I, I know world. that that many many people, and obviously I am very very aware of your your story. But just to so somebody who might not know, you had an incredibly uh, heart breaking, heart rending ten year journey to 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 get Jamie your daughter. Just mm-hmm. so the context, but yeah. Um, uh, having done 23 IVFs, 15 in Australia, mm. I found out about this great doctor in Athens who was a Melbourne Greek like me that was producing 600 babies a month out of his clinic in Athens. Uh, he was a leader in research and development. Um, and, uh, yeah, they call him the Pelican. And so I decided, <laughs> uh, uh, I was lucky enough to have an IVF doctor here that was awesome uh, they pointed me in the direction of what I call my pimp doctors, which was this uh, great couple that um, liaise with um, the patient, me, and this great doctor. And I do all my testing through these guys, the Bernsteins. Uh, they used to be uh, uh, running a, a place called Fertility East, and they pimped me out to this Greek-Australian doctor at this after clinic. After 22 After 15 here. 15, okay, right. So then I did eight with my wow. Greek doctor, my Greek doctor who has eight children of his own, four adult, four younger children, and he was a game changer for me. So he didn't know who I was, you know, he just knew my medical history. So after um, we finally got there and a lot of losses along the way, which have been well uh, documented through my book and through two 60-minute stories, um, having lost um, children and having given birth to a stillborn, uh, my daughter Stevie, um, I decided, uh, that was my 18th attempt, I decided to go back again and again. And finally, on my 23rd attempt, I got pregnant with Jamie and, um, you know, everything changed. Number 23, Michael Jordan's number is my lucky number too, you know. So um, I wrote a book. Uh, prior to finding out I was pregnant with Jamie, which honoured uh, my daughter who passed. And and I sent my doctor, who didn't know who I was or what I did, a copy of this book. At this point, while, you know, uh, just before this book was released, I found out I was pregnant with Jamie, but I didn't want to go public with it because I'd had a lot of bleeding in the first three months of that pregnancy. And um, so I lay low and walked around with a lot of big handbags in front of my, um, in front of my belly. And finally admitted to it on the last day of the shoot with 60 Minutes that I was, in fact, 22 weeks pregnant. That impacted greatly on the story because, you know, um, we're all in the trenches with my story prior to that and it was the fantastic little happy ending to um, a very harrowing story on George and myself and what we'd gone through in order to have, you know, our daughter. So I send my book to my doctor and then my doctor and I strike up this whole other relationship, and uh, he comes to the um, the christening of our daughter Jamie on this Greek island called Tinos, which has the most beloved Greek church on it, which delivers miracles. So I went there and prayed after my twenty second attempt, and prayed and made a promise in in a very you know um, spontaneous moment. I had an epiphany and I reached out to God, the universe, Mother Nature, whoever it was in that moment and said, if you're able to deliver me a healthy baby, I promise I will come back here to christen it. And guess what? April Fool's Day, I find out I'm pregnant. (laughs) And on November 25th that year, I give birth to a very healthy baby. And I say to my husband, I made this promise. I don't care if it's just me and the baby, but we're going. We're going. So seven months later, 72 of us go to this Greek <laughs> island and my doctor comes with his four youngest and then invites us to his youngest's christening in Ithaca. Right. Long story, long as Effie would say, we're finally in Ithaca, the place that I've chosen <laughs> in my five things. Um, and so we went there for the christening of his youngest, Nico. And um, that became something uh, that 
a place that we kept going back to because my doctor has a house there and we would holiday with him and his family. And like Ulysses or Odysseus in um, Greek, you know, it took us 10-year odyssey so, to Ithaca find our home. Is, is the home of, Odysse- of Odysseus. That is, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we know the story, goes to Troy, can't win this war, you know, Trojan horse, yeah. wins the war. We think he's fine. He's heading back to his island, except it took him 10 years to find his way yeah. back home. And, in, and, you know, if Jamie is that home, it took us 10 years to find her. And, and then the poetry of my doctor being on this island uh, and us uh, celebrating, you know, our children together and holidaying together every year oh, it's on beautiful. this island is um, particularly but, apt. Th- there's a question I'm, I'm really keen to ask, which is given that story that's been well documented about the incredible odyssey to get the happy ending, how does that inform your motherhood going forward but also how do you think it will inform how Jamie will own that story? Because it's not like she's not going to, you know, hear about it. Um, any effect or, or... Well, it's funny because um, my daughter Stevie died on May 10th. Now, that often coincides with Mother's Day. It's either the day before some years, some days it's on the day. Um, Jamie said, Mama, what do you want for Mother's Day? And I said, you know what I'd really want? I really just want to be in my room for a few hours on my own, you know, you and Dada can go and do some things, but I just want to be in my room on my own for a number of hours because I knew I would wake up. Uh, You know, you you, like like all of us out there, you know, when an anniversary of something's coming, you can start feeling the pressure of that that day um, in the lead up to it. So um, then... You know, obviously I came out looking like Marty Feldman with my goiter <laughs> eyes and um, after many hours of crying. And she, she'd she already known a little bit about Stevie. I'd touched on it two weeks earlier. Something came up and I'd sort of mentioned it, but she didn't really delve into it that much. And then we spoke about it that day. And since then she's been wanting to see images of Stevie. And on the day when... Uh, I lost my daughter. I had an incredible grief counsellor who was with me throughout everything uh, who arrived uh, when she knew I was going into labour and documented, um, you know, which is difficult to get your head around because how do you pose with a child that you've just lost? And um, do you smile? Well, what do you do? You know, and, and is it odd and is it the antithesis of when you would normally take a photo and what that's supposed to represent? So we do have images uh, and which have turned out to be, you know, a great gift mm. and this woman knows what she's doing and she's, you know, got an order of Australia for the work that she's done in this area. So Jamie wants to see those images. So it has come up. She's aware of part of the story and, in fact, yesterday when I was driving her to school she was asking more about it. And I said to her, I will tell you everything when I think it's the right time. You know enough for now. And I promise you, you'll know everything. Well, there's a book. She'll Google my name, you know, before too long and she'll be able to read a lot about it. But she does already know. Um, but do, do you think it. the effect of that, do you think it's going to make you want her to, to live up to the amazing effort and journey or her think, I've got to repay mum by being a Nobel Prize winner because of that incredible... Uh, sacrifice and journey, or, or it will just be an, an amazing part of the I would legacy. hope that I would give her the same gift my father gave me, which was to let her know that she has the capacity to do what she needs to do in the world should she cho- choose to do it. Uh, I would hope that she would know that she was very wanted and loved, seen, but I'm also tough with her too. I'm not a pushover and, and I'm very aware that the world's not going to treat her the way that I do so that she needs to, you know, have some experience of, of the world. And, you know, as my mother says, she will learn yes, but she will learn no too. <laughs> and so uh, my daughter is uh, adored, seen, heard. She knows she has capacities that she, you know, can pull on. But at the end of the day, she knows she's not alone in this world and that's an important message we get out to everyone in this world, young or old, um, and that not being alone has 
its benefits, but the other reality is you're not the only one. So um, be aware of that and use what you can when you need to in order to do what you need to do in this world. So, you know, I don't have any great expectations, um, but I think by supporting her and and uh, letting her know that the most difficult things are possible. I mean, I had a career against all odds. You know, when there's 90% unemployment, you can add how much do you load that when you looked like me in the 80s? <laughs> Plenty. Uh, that when I went to have a child, I got given the graph that was um, subterraneous in terms of like I kept saying, do, do not show me the graph. Yeah. I've seen the graph. But, you know, that you can with persistence, uh, belief and reaching out to people who are the best at what they do in every capacity, being it psychological, medical, um, and all the rest, um, achieve the impossible. So I, w- I would hope that that's what you would take. Now, we're moving on to the fifth choice on five of my life, which is often my favourite choice uh, because it's something that I can't really research beyond Mm. reading what people send me, but it's not something that's in the public domain. Uh, and I'm fascinated to hear about the gold sovereign coin made into a ring. My mother left Greece when she... Did you ever take it off? I did, yeah. I put it on today. Um, my mother left Greece at 18 on her own. She came out to Australia. She was the only ambitious one academically in right. her family. So um, my mother's had a lifetime away from her family. Everyone else was there. So when I went back as an adult and I met my grandmother, I was one of the grandchildren. She didn't know. My brother had gone back a lot lot more than I had. So she had this sovereign, this gold English sovereign that she'd kept hidden from everyone, um, which she was going to give to me. And she gave it to me. But she gave me that look of, don't tell anyone I've given you this. (laughs) Um, And I made it into what is uh, a huge ring. It's I mean, gorgeous. That is massive, it's very isn't it? unique and striking and beautiful. And then I would wear it around her and ask her to pass me something at the table, <laughs> featuring it heavily <laughs> right in front of her eyes <laughs> as an in joke between her and I. Um, so she was um, she was an incredible mother and um, it produced a very good mother in my mother. Um, and I'd never seen my mother be a sister or a daughter. I'd only ever seen her be a wife and a mother and a friend my whole life. So it was great when the three generations were together, the three of us in the room that my grandmother ended up dying in um, and um, the, the room that my mother was born in, the smallest room in the house. Your Greeks are big on that. Uh, they'll have a whole house, but we'll be in the smallest room in the house. Apparently it's easier to, it's cheaper to keep warm and and they like to be physically close. Um, so, yeah, she was a, a really um, huge figure for me because I hadn't been around grandparents. I didn't know my dad's parents. Um, and she was the only one that I really got to know. Um, she died at 93 and I was with her when she died. We all were in that room. Right. Um, my mother got a call from her brother and said, um, if you want to be here, we, she's dying, um, you might want to jump on a flight. So she was going and then George, my husband, who you know very well, um, said, you've got to go too. So I flew to be with her um, and was literally in the room when she passed. And again, you know, when we talk about losses, that was the perfect death. She was surrounded by her children, none of which she'd buried. You know, like a, a, yeah. it's very difficult. You know, at 93, if all your children are alive, that, that's a good thing mm. with her grandchildren. Uh, in the room that she'd birthed them all in and the room that she'd lived in. Um, And it was ideal. And she was buried three doors down from her home. So it was a real privilege to be there for that. It's one of the things that I love about this show is hearing people talk. It's just seeing you and your body language and, you know, your your tone of face, as they say, when you're talking (laughs) about that. And you're you're fiddling with the ring whilst you tell that story. What, what What a... gorgeous story and thank you for for sharing it with us and, and all your choices so mary it's been just delightful having you on five my life that there's a six trick question yes um who would you like to hear on five my life next and why there is a woman that i have discovered and fallen in love with that uh for whatever reason i do not understand is not regarded an australian treasure ah right uh, and should be her name is deborah francis white 
She grew up in Queensland and uh, took a gap year and went to London and has never come back apart from visiting family and doing shows here on the odd occasion. If you were to ask her uh, what she does, I would imagine she would tell you she's a stand-up comedian because she's extremely funny. Um, She's also a writer. And in my mind, she's like the female Stephen Fry, like frightfully bright, um, hilarious, and does important work wrapped up in comedy. And she has this incredible podcast that's hugely popular called The Guilty Feminist. Yeah, I, I fell upon her because I did an episode as Effie. And they, she'd never had a character do an episode before. And I just said, look, I just think Effie would be better value. And we chose the theme of marriage, which she hadn't charted before. And her themes are either very important or ridiculous like, you know, uh, body hair or, you know, or, you know, wh- whatever. You know, she has got incredible range and her subjects can go from the most shallow to the deepest. So um, Deborah Francis White is a treat and she she's the lady that gave Phoebe her break the fee the flea bag lady. yes so so not only is she a I mean such a good choice thank you we will chase her up not only a wonderful comedian and talent herself but she enables other female talents so Phoebe Waller Bridge didn't no one would put her bloody show on everyone now raves about her show yeah. but if it wasn't for your choice no one would know about it because she put it on in a theatre and yeah. then sent it to Edinburgh yeah. and then we all know the story that we know yeah but so I. Thank you. Deborah Francis yeah. White. Get her on the blower. Yeah. Get her on the blower. Um, she does this. Um, she is just, um, you know, all things. You know, she's smart. She's funny. She's self-deprecating. She's she's um, a talent vacuum. She cannot find enough of it. She cannot showcase it enough. And she performs next to it so brilliantly. Wonderful. Mary Christmas, thank you so much for sharing your choices on Five of My Life. My pleasure. Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 